Hello, Nerd Initiative fam. It's Max Taff coming to you with a recap of what we learned this week on Agatha All Along's Episode 4, If I Can't Reach You, Let My Song Teach You. Let's get into it. So starting off with Alice Wu, obviously our woman of the episode this week. It was her trial as the Protection Witch. It took place in what seemed like a familiar location to her. It looked like either a childhood home or a home owned by her mother. Some interesting th things that we learned this week. Uh, her mom died in a hotel fire while on tour. As we know, her mom is Lorna Wu, who in the MCU is a famous rock musician, best known for making the most popular version of the Witch's Road ballad, not on the Witch's Road, which is what was previously established or thought of. She is traveling the road to break her generational curse. As her mom told her, it would one day save her. So we know that she has motivations to break a curse that is affecting not only her, but her family members as well. Her mom, possibly even her grandmother, who we also learned could be a witch in last week's episode during her hallucinations during that trial. One thing that I found really cool was the fact that she was able to jump into action to help Lilia and Jennifer as they were being sort of attacked by this curse once it was activated during the trial. She kind of jumped into action. She grabbed that knife from Rio. She drew a circle around them of protection, doing her job as that protective witch part of the coven. Uh, so that was really interesting to see how that became almost instinctual to her, especially given the fact that it seemed that she was probably the least in tune with her magical abilities of all the witches in this coven. She mentions that she never really believed in the things that her mom taught her and seemed like she had lost touch completely with that magical aspect once her mom died. So I think there was definitely some resentment towards witchcraft and magic there. There's definitely you know, some trauma associated with it in her past. So I think that she kind of just has a very negative outlook towards it. But definitely seems to be getting in tune with her craft, especially in this episode, realizing her power, realizing how, how much she can help the other members of her coven, and actually enjoying that familial vibe that she gets from practicing with other witches, which seemed to be a very common theme throughout this episode with the other witches as well. We did see her kind of defeat that demonic, almost personification of the curse that's on her family during the trial where that big, scary, terrifying red demon kind of came out and she ended up killing it by using that version of the witch's ballad that her mom made. Um, some interesting facts about that, though, that I learned in this episode was the fact that, one, it seemed at least to Lilia Calderu, that her mom was constantly trying to open the witch's road by using that song. As we learned in episode two, in order to open the witch's road, you do need to sing the ballad with a coven. So I'm guessing that Lorna, Alice's mom, at her concerts was trying to sing this with her fans, who Alice described as being her coven. And also just, I guess, any witches that would be in the audience that were singing along with her, maybe trying to open that road. Obviously, she had been trying to get this curse removed to protect her daughter. That is what it seems like her main motivation has been, especially given what we've learned so far in the series. Also, one thing that Agatha pointed out, which I found very interesting and very cool, was the fact that not only was it trying to open the witch's road, but also that that particular version of the ballad that her mother wrote was designed to protect her daughter and keep her safe. As it was revealed, Alice has this weird birthmark, or so she thought was a birthmark, but was actually a burn. It seemed like maybe at one point she was supposed to die at the hands of this curse or this demon, but this witch's road song that is constantly being sung by someone somewhere around the world, given its popularity and the fact that her mother was this famous recording artist, protects Alice and has continued to protect her all these years from succumbing to that fate. So very interesting, still a lot to learn about her and this curse. And even though this was her trial, we still have so much to unpack here. So I'm really excited to see where this goes in the coming weeks. Now, moving on to Jennifer Kale. During that scene where all the witches are around the campfire, kind of sharing stories, kind of bonding a little bit here. She revealed to the other witches around the campfire that she was an 11th generation root worker, something that I found very interesting. I didn't know what a root worker was, but upon looking into it, root working is a traditional medicine of Black Americans and has its origins in slave culture, especially in the Deep South. Also related to hoodoo or voodoo, it is a conjure technique that involves using plants for magical work to heal people and to perform other rituals. So very interesting that she brought that up, that even though Agatha didn't label her as a blood witch, she does have a family history of magic 
and magic practices. So I found that a very interesting thing to note about her character. It was also revealed that she was a midwife, obviously sometime in the last century, I'm assuming. She goes on to talk more about her binding, which is really the most interesting thing about her character. Because from the beginning, Agatha goes to recruit her, talks immediately about her binding, that being her main drive for going down the witch's road, looking to unbind her magic. And a couple of interesting things with that. Given the fact that she has described herself as being bound, last week's episode we saw in her hallucinations this scary, old-timey kind of doctor who was drowning her in the kitchen sink, and we realized that he was the one responsible to for her binding. However, now she kind of illuminates a little bit further on what exactly happened. And she talks about how, you know, during her time as a midwife, she was invited to the brand new Obstetrics Association of Greater Boston to quote unquote share her expertise. But actually, it was a trap to lure her in so that I guess she could be attacked or not a lot of detail is being given about this at this point, but there is something deeper that happened here. And as a result, we learned that her magic was bound by that male doctor that we saw last week um, during her hallucination. And the confusing thing is that she mentions that she still doesn't understand how he was able to bind her magic because he didn't have magic of his own, or at least that she knew of. So very interesting things to touch on here because for those who don't know, when a witch is bound, if you've ever seen the craft and whatnot, it means that her power is being locked off. They are not able to use their powers or their abilities to cast spells or perform magic. So obviously, I think that's probably why some of her potions and things that she has tried to still make and different remedies and retinol serums that she's been selling haven't worked out in recent times and why she's getting sued for selling faulty products because she hasn't had that connection to her magic. Now, this could not be maybe a magical binding that was performed on her. It could be something more emotional, trauma-based that maybe locked her off from her magical abilities. And I really liked this theory because it kind of makes sense when you think about the fact that this doctor is being described as not having magic, not being able to do magic or didn't do any magic on her when she was bound. So it really raises the question of how he would be able to do this to her. And it's my thought process that through whatever trauma he put her through when she was lured to this obstetrics, you know, place in Boston, that something must have happened to her, something that put a mental block on her ability to do magic. The reason why I'm saying that is because we see that when it really came down to it in this episode, when the trial was over and they were back on the road and teen you know, collapses, they reveal that he had a humongous glass shard in his side they needed to help him. He was dying. She really jumped into action. Again, similar to Alice, using that instinctual magic to kind of know what to do. She grabbed some kind of a shell or something, filled it with water, went into the moonlight, was chanting, was able to make a remedy to save him. And my question is, how was she able to do that without magic? I mean, it's one thing to kind of mix a potion together with your coven. You're all, you know, pooling your magic together to perform this ritual. But her on her own, dipping into the moonlight, creating this very, very powerful, it seemed to me, like a makeshift potion to heal that humongous gash in his side, just like that. It makes me believe that maybe there's more to her binding than what we're being led to believe. And I do think that it might be something psychological, might be something mental that's blocking her from accessing her magic. So I'm really interested to see where that goes. I'm really interested to see more into her backstory and to see how this doctor, you know, what exactly happened to her and, and how old she actually is. Because even though we know she is older, she's not as old as Lilia, she's probably not as old as Agatha. They have crossed paths before her and Agatha, so we do know she's at least got to be 100 years old, especially given the dress of the doctors um, and what he was wearing in last week's episode. So I'm very interested to see how her story plays out. Now, speaking of Lilia Calderu, one of my favorite members of the coven, just because she's so kooky and crazy, she really tapped into that very mothering and nurturing quality about her. She's very supportive of the other members of her coven, especially shown when she encourages and commends Jennifer on her use of magic to save Teen um, and to save Jolock's character. She shows the witches when they're 
all around that campfire, a scar on her neck where a vampire once bit her. So another vampire reference in the MCU, kind of leading up to Blade, if that ever happens, and, you know, kind of going into these little vampire things that we've been seeing dropped in Loki and different projects. That was very interesting. But she mentions that she got a good lick in when she knocked the vampire's other tooth out. So she's very tough, very spunky. She's not a person to back down, which is just very on brand for both her and Patty Lupone as a person, seeing her in interviews and the way she she speaks and her commanding presence. She even bucks up to Aubrey Plaza's character Rio about the fact that she won't forget what they all overheard about her collecting their bodies earlier in the episode when Agatha was gaslighting her into talking smack over the PA system in the recording booth during the trial. Once again, she shows that she has a huge chip on her shoulder about how witches are portrayed in pop culture and in society as a whole, mentioning, you know, especially from the beginning when we first meet her, she blames Agatha for being the type of witch that makes people question if they all eat babies. Last week, she made a reference to um, how witches are portrayed, you know, asking, do you see any pointy hats around here? And again, this week, she kind of mentions that, you know, it's not fair how they're always being painted in such a dark light and always being personified as these versions of evil and talking to goats and things. You know, she, she's always had this kind of resentment towards the way society treats witches. So that's an interesting kind of tell into what she could have possibly gone through in the past. We know that she is over 400 years old. So we're talking, you know, very easily could be going into the vein of like Italian Renaissance type of witch. We did see last episode how during her hallucination, she saw a younger version of herself in that like almost Renaissance medieval type of garb. Um, And the timeline does match up. So... I mean, it's interesting to see where things are going to go with her, especially, you know, also with the fact that at the beginning of the episode, when they first embark on that second trial, she's looking at these depictions of witches being hung, burned, drowned, etc. on the walls of this, you know, house or recording studio, and we see her just crying about it. I have a theory that she once had a coven and it was a very supportive coven that she, you know, she kind of grew up in maybe. And during her youth, especially kind of tying into that hallucination from last week where she kind of wakes up for it from it and she's telling Agatha, they're dead, they're all dead, everyone's dead, there's death. It kind of ties into my theory where I think she came from this coven that was all massacred during something kind of like a Spanish Inquisition. The timeline matches up. She is an Italian witch. She spoke Italian in last week's episode. Um, Patty Lapone has described this character as being a 400-year-old Sicilian witch. So we do know that this all kind of ties into her backstory here. Um, definitely taking place in Italy. Definitely, I think she lost a lot of people. Um, I do think that she did have that coven. She's got that mothering, nurturing quality about her, like I mentioned before, where she's kind of like very encouraging to the other members of the coven. She likes kind of having these other witches around her and kind of, you know, buddying up with them, teaming up with them for this witch's road adventure. So I do think that's something that's almost familiar to her, something maybe that she's missed. So I, I do think that there is a lot of that kind of tying into her character. I'm definitely thinking Spanish Inquisition vibes and something something really bad must have happened. Now, moving on to Rio, the green witch of this episode. She came out of nowhere, kind of crawling herself out of Mrs. Hart's grave. So, I mean, there's a couple different theories that I have going with this. One could be that she was Mrs. Hart the entire time, and maybe that's how she was able to not only help them conjure up the witch's road, but just also, you know, part of this adventure, keeping an eye on Agatha. I do have a couple of theories, you know, a couple of things in the back of my head going with this. I do think that her and Joe Locke appearing at the same time in the beginning of the show was not a coincidence. I do think that they are both kind of vehicles to push Agatha onto this journey, breaking her out of Wanda's curse, pushing her to go down the witch's road to get the power. She kind of summoned the Salem Seven, making Agatha kind of desperate to defend herself. Teen showed up at the exact same time almost that she did originally. A lot of different things kind of linking up between the two of them. So I do think that there is some kind of a a connection between her and Mrs. Hart. She did also crawl out of where they buried Mrs. Hart's corpse. So that was interesting. She also has this weird connection to death. In the series, as we know, you know, going back to even episode one, right after Agatha found, you know, Wanda's body and she's in the police station, that's right when Rio kind of shows up. So a lot of connections to death when it comes to Rio. A lot of people are 
theorizing that she could be death in the MCU. And it's very heavily hinted that she actually could be death in this episode specifically. While bonding with the coven around the campfire, she talks about having a scar of her own. Um, She tells the story of how long ago she loved someone but had to do something she did not want to do despite it being her job. So keyword there, her job. She goes on to talk about how... This is something that she had to do, and it was something that she couldn't really get out of. And a couple times during the episode, especially when Teen is seen dying from his injury, Agatha turns to her and says, no. Obviously, there's some kind of a history here between them, especially when she was telling that story around the campfire. She kept kind of like looking over her shoulder and like uh, like kind of looking at Agatha from, you know, behind her. So there's obviously a very deep history between these two. Now, the interesting thing here is that there's a lot of connections to death kind of forming through Rio. So it's very possible that she is death. And especially when she kind of first comes in and they're like, oh, so, you know, you're you're the Green Witch. She's like, not so much a Green Witch, but the Green Witch, she says in like her demonic voice. And another interesting thing that I found is that when she said that she was kind of summoned down there, and then she corrects herself to say, oh, I guess maybe up here. So Could she be that she was coming from hell and maybe like the lair of Mephisto or the realm of Mephisto and coming up to the witch's road? That could be something really interesting too. So a lot of really interesting tidbits about Rio in this episode. And the interesting thing is that the heavy implications that her and Agatha were previously lovers. Honestly, I'll be honest with you, the chemistry was hot and heavy between these two. They almost kissed a couple times. There was definitely just a very palpable chemistry and energy. A lot of past, just as we've seen in that first episode. And there's definitely something that gets this very visceral emotional reaction from Agatha whenever she sees Rio. So it could be that there is some tie-ins with Nicholas Scratch, Agatha's son. And maybe this thing that Rio had to do as part of her job hurt Agatha, obviously, and was something to do with her son. Or it could be something like a relationship gone bad. There's definitely a lot of tension between these two characters and I'm eating it up. I'm so excited to see where this goes, what happened between them. I know given you know the things we've seen in trailers and whatnot there are going to be some flashbacks i think or just some trials that take place in the past or in past kind of times just kind of similar to how this episode took place in a 70s rock glam recording studio slash alice's house so i'm interested to see where these things go and how rio's character continues to unfold and what she is hiding because we know her and agatha are hiding a juicy secret and i can't wait to see what it is now moving on to our head witch in charge, Agatha Harkness. So in this episode, we learned quite a few interesting things about Agatha. It was revealed that she got into some kind of a tussle with the Daughters of Liberty at some point. Um, The Daughters of Liberty were a group of females fighting for liberty during the American Revolution. So again, a couple hundred years ago, kind of tying into, you know, Agatha being from Salem times, American Revolution, you know, following and right around those times as well. So, you know, it's kind of folding into Agatha's already pre-existing narrative that we've had established not only from WandaVision, but from what we've learned in little bits from here and Agatha all along. She showed the other witches her battle scar on her elbow where she explains was being stabbed by one of them with a knitting needle. Which I found really interesting because knitting needles are not necessarily the sharpest thing. So that must have really hurt. But she does mention or allude to the fact that she did take them down. So proud of our girl here for kicking ass. As the other witches laugh, though, if I don't know if you guys caught this, but she does look around almost enjoying having other people to laugh and share these types of stories with. She looks around kind of nervously, but almost like she's enjoying having a coven around her. So I found that very interesting. The fact that she's always been this covenless witch, but now she's actually enjoying the company of other witches around her. So... I think that's really cool. It's showing that Agatha is this multifaceted character. And you do have to remember, you know, where we met her in WandaVision, she was under the influence of the Darkhold. She did have the Darkhold in her possession. She was actively practicing that that dark magic from the Darkhold. But now after Wanda took the Darkhold from her, it's been about three years that she was trapped in Agatha's curse as revealed in episode one. So she's been three years removed from this Darkhold. Now that she's finally back to her senses, she's finally back to herself as Agatha, Harkness, the badass witch, you know, we might be seeing more of that emotion coming from her, more of that humanity returning to her as she is further removed from the dark hold. Obviously, we still don't understand the circumstances fully of which she obtained the dark hold, how long she's had it, but we do know that it does tie into her son as it's been rumored by 
Jennifer Kale speaking to Teen that her son was traded for the Darkhold. We did see in last week's hallucination, she pulls back the blanket and the baby bassinet to reveal the Darkhold. So, I mean, it's being heavily implied that she did trade her son for that Darkhold. But we still don't know the full details. We still don't know how long she's had it for. So she could have been going for over 100 years with the Darkhold's influence taking her. And now she's finally able to kind of reconnect with her humanity, reconnect with the fact of having a coven, and, and just, you know, being able to enjoy being around other witches, which she hasn't in a very long time, especially since in WandaVision, we saw that she eviscerated her entire coven, essentially. So, and she is known in the MCU by other witches as being a witch killer, which Lydia Calderu called her. So very interesting little tidbits that we're putting together here with Agatha's character. I'm really excited to finally get into the meat and potatoes of what has gone on in her backstory and in each of these women's backstories too they're all so fascinating in their own ways and they each bring a different element of mystery to unpack throughout this series so i'm so excited to see where this goes she does show like i said a bit more of her maternal side she has taken a maternal interest in teen jock schaefer let it slip in an interview that she did during press for agatha all along that we do see a more maternal side to Agatha, and then she kind of backtracks and tries to change what she said or what she meant. But we are seeing it. She does take a maternal interest in Teen. Now, I don't know if she necessarily sees her son in him or thinks that he is her son. At the end, we do see Rio during that frustrating cutoff to the credits where she kind of says, Agatha, he's not yours. He doesn't belong to you. He's not your, you know, he's not your boy or whatever. That Rio is telling her that it's not her son. And she kind of gets upset whenever anybody brings up her son or anything to do with that or anything to do with teen in general. She's very protective of him. And we did see a lot of that. She was very panicked when it was possible that teen could have died from his injuries. We are seeing just that side of Agatha coming out more and more. And she's taken such an interest in teen that I'm excited to see what it is that that sigil on his mouth represents who put it on him and i i just can't wait to know it's driving me nuts an interesting thing that she revealed is that she did not put the sigil on teen as he does directly ask her when he's finally coming to after you know after surviving his whole or ordeal but she wouldn't know if she had because the sigil also affects the witch who cast it so again there's so much to unpack here I don't know. She called it last week a clumsy glamour, something she never would have done. But then again, Agatha is good at trying to cover her tracks and get people to kind of, you know, glaze over things and not pay attention to her, to the bad things that she does. So I don't know who to believe or what to believe, especially coming out of her mouth, right? So I'm, I'm really interested to see what is going on. And especially when Teen asked her what happened to her son and she kind of just got frustrated and walked away. She she's, seems to be the type of person that likes to just avoid the, those heavy conversations. She did it earlier when Rio was talking about kind of what happened between them and the things that she had to do that hurt Agatha. So there's still so much to unpack and I'm, I'm so, so ready to have answers, you guys. I'm so excited. And hopefully you guys will tune in for next week's little recap that I'm going to be doing here on Nerd Initiative's channels. Thank you so much for your time. You can follow me on Twitter at Vigilante Vibes. Make sure to check out my Marvel podcast, Vigilante Vibes, a Marvel podcast on every platform. And make sure to follow Nerd Initiative on all the socials. See you soon.